You know, it's funny to me how much ruckus such exotic pets you lot are so fond of can rile up when they don't get their way. How many nasty little surprises they've got cooped up in their unassuming forms. Why, I've seen barbs and venoms that would leave folk like yourself looking where they step for the rest of their natural lives. Now see, that's the problem with our current arrangements. These little critters are very, um, enthusiastic and prone to nipping little parts off you. Way I see it, I've spared you an awful lot of hassle in a manner only I can provide. So that'll be 250 gold. Not next week. Now. When undertaking the creation of a player character, there are as many approaches as there are players. But a question I see time and again with a vast ocean of responses stating the same points is how do I make my characters more interesting? Or how do I avoid getting bored of my character? Now, it's impossible to answer that second question as it can involve factors like gameplay mechanics as well as RP, but the first question is something I'll aim to tackle in this video for you. The monologue you heard earlier is from the introduction of Ezri, a character I am playing as in one of my current D&D campaigns. I'm going to go over the concept I had when making Ezri, as one of the driving points was making a character that behaved and performed in a manner I hadn't done previously. This is what I'm hoping this video can help you with, forming an image in your mind of what a character is and does, then using the system mechanics to find something that best fits the image you have. I'll give a brief rundown of myself as a player instead of a DM. I've fallen into the forever frontline role, and whilst this won't turn out to be a deviation from that role, I did aim to avoid just being another simple subversion concept. I did things like, it's a barbarian, but the rage is a satyr on a joybender and not knowing his own strength. Or, it's a warlock, but he is secretly the patron that's possessing the body, and it's the host which is gradually relinquishing the power to, you know, make them stronger. Both were concepts that I didn't carry out so well in game, because whilst I really enjoyed something like, yeah, there's a satyr on a joybender, he's a happy hulk, it just ended up being all that his character was, and it's still, despite being a subversion, a different reason for a barbarian to just hit things. Whether you are someone who is innately creative or otherwise, you will have topics that grab your fascination. Things that you have binged in a bout of procrastination for an evening or two, for one reason or another. One of these escapes from the responsibilities of whatever burden of adulthood I was dodging at the time was Globsters. Thick, white, pungent, and oozing piles of- Wait, let me start over. Globsters. What a name, right? It was a name given to a series of unidentified organic masses that would wash up on beaches all over the world. To my understanding, they still do it today. I won't bore you with the deeper history, there's a lovely video by Jacob Geller that covers the topic, along with other aspects of deep sea horrors, uh, link in the description below. But I was gripped by this concept of something otherworldly washing ashore, something alien to this world or forgotten by it. The setting I created Esri for was more like a grim fantasy imagining of Industrial Revolution England, where insects and crustaceans would be harvested for their kite and weave clothes instead of armour, and magic required licences. This is where the first and second bits of advice I will give you are, use a topic that inspires you, and create your character for the world you are playing in. Whilst I understand that second one isn't as universally loved, I will admit it is a pet peeve of mine when a player just throws their Harry Potter fanfic insert into whatever Roll20 session they manage to find. Please stop doing that. The topic can be anything from a hobby to a brief interest that lasted a few days. It could be from a love of the Viking era sagas, or a questionable fascination with large piles of white goop washing up in places. Making your character for the world they inhabit is easier done when the idea is fresh, rather than using an old concept and slapping some town names on it and calling it a day. When making Esri, the first things I took note of from the world were its industrial revolution time setting, navigating overgrown insectoid aspects of everyday life, 
an underlying theme of how cheap sentient life is, especially when your body is likely to be used as labour after death. I did my usual thing of coming up with concepts that fell into this rut of, it's this but that, and trying to fit them into job occupations. There was a goblin-like cleric that acted as a lamplighter, an aging orc stars druid who used to map the world when it was worst well known, but the personality parts didn't resonate so well. They felt redundant in their settings, which is a great theme to explore for a character, but not to my taste when I'm actually playing the game. So I started looking more into things that could reflect that changing place in the natural order, the realization that your position has changed. Stories by H.P. Lovecraft are a great example of this uh, that come reasonably close to the post-industrial Victorian setting our DM was aiming for. It was around this time that I came across the Globster phenomenon and thought, that's it. Globman. I wanted Ezri to be this smuggler of exotic pets, someone who travelled the fringes of the islands to fulfil contracts of the callous aristocracy. With a job so dangerous and remote, how would a lone individual achieve this, though? Insert tragic backstory time. Esri was not always the callous smuggler he is today. His early life within the village of the Wilderow Isles was without remarkability, being one of a set of twin elf brothers taking up the local trade of fishing. Something remarkable would happen to this village, however, something horrifically and inescapably remarkable. On a night like any other, the waves dredged up a carcass of the old world, a remnant of some force that no longer fit in the shape of the realm in which it had emerged. Esri, his brother Richt, along with a handful of other locals, were the first to discover this mass upon their shores. The pale white shape of strained elegance seemed lifeless to all present, with Esri offering to reach out to the larger settlements for support in cataloguing and disposal. Yet Richt, his brother, saw something he did not, convincing the elders that this would only bring ire to their locality. Over the following days, more of the townsfolk became strange gathering around the body of this corpse from beyond the veil, performing bizarre rituals and speaking in tongues unknown to these parts. Esri saw the madness that had gripped his neighbours, his friends, and his brother, opting to put a stop to this whilst he still could. During the early hours of one evening, he managed to pick a moment of lapse in the rituals to set this abomination alight. The amniotic sack of an object, with no protest to its fate, shriveled into charred misery, to the crippling dismay of its onlooking worshippers. Esri could not have predicted that these people too would suffer as a result of his actions, first seeing Richt, then the rest sear from invisible heat before collapsing into the same pale mulch as their idol. As soon as his horror loosened enough for Esri to resume motion, he dove to the puddle where once his brother stood, only to be met with a scathing agony. The substance seemed to pour up his arms, burning these strange etchings into his skin where it found purchase. Even before the branding cooled, Esri could feel knowledge of the formless thing flowing through his weakened mind, the power to alter parts of oneself. For the same reason it hadn't been able to claim his mind initially, it failed to entrap him in its death throes as well. However, it had nonetheless left those parting abilities, along with a hatred of whatever it was that had visited desolation upon Esri's village. Following the event that mired his early years, Esri travelled to Hartwood, seeking whatever work would put him in a position to test this new knowledge, honing himself in the ways of combat. On one particular excursion, he found he was able to give untamed animals the ability to understand and obey his will. Esri soon put this gift to less than benevolent uses, however, swiftly becoming a go-to for supplying exotic pets to those with discreet appetites. With each success, he felt the pain of his founding experience numb, travelling to the rough sea islands and the shoal to further ply his trade. Having lived a further few decades on from his origins, fate would throw a rock at Esri once more, 
whilst travelling to Karsain, he came across news framed in one of the displays on his vessel. A rather adventurous human aristocrat was depicted with the caption of Fresh Discovery from the Frontiers. Garnet Dubois stands alongside her prize, hauled from shores unknown. For the first time since the corruption of his home, Esri's mind burned with seething intent. This woman, Garnet, was stood beside something that very much resembled what washed ashore that fateful night. So with a character and a little backstory in hand, now is the time to look at the options in the system your DM is running and find something that fits your theme mechanically. I know some of you may think this edgy tale screams warlock, or perhaps the animal smuggling aspect might lean towards a ranger or a rogue. Actually, I ended up giving myself another challenge here. See, fighters are often considered the most basic class. Hit stuff with weapon you're skilled with, be happy. However, I settled on a rune knight. Now, you may wonder how a giant aligned rune carver could possibly relate to a monster possessed animal smuggler, but this is where my next piece of advice comes in. Think beyond the books. A paladin who upholds honor and duty is all well and good if that is all you need, but will it be enough to hold your interest? A monk who does martial arts and is either a pacifist, drunk, or both, can be enjoyable, but it's limited. Let's take a look at the couple of abilities that grabbed me, bearing in mind that we started the campaign at level three, and the aim was for this to not really run too much beyond level six over a longer period of time. So Rune Carver allows us to use four runes initially, um, any combination of the two at this level, for varying effects which are based on a passive or an active, generally a bonus action ability. The Frost Rune in particular drew my eye as it has a passive ability regarding animal handling and helping there, which also works with the active given that we expect that Esri would have some sort of knowledge of the venoms and poisons that the creatures of the lands produce, so having that buffer to constitution works quite well. The Fire Rune also appealed in being something that I could reskin to fit, well how does he capture these animals? How does he uh, trap anything that's this dangerous venomous creature from afar? I didn't really want to go with like nets or other ranged weaponry. It needed to be someone that was up close and used his strength to overpower them. And that's where this image of chains didn't quite work, but we have the theme of this possession of this like tendrily oily stuff that sort of loops off him venom symbiote style. Which coincidentally leads us into Giant's Might, the other third level ability, where as a bonus action we can grow magically large for a minute. For Ezri, I don't really imagine him growing larger himself physically, but these oily tendrils encapsulating his body, making the space he occupies greater. Now of course this doesn't affect anything mechanically, the rules are still being followed in the same way, it's just describing and envisaging something slightly different. And other than mentioning that he is an elf, I haven't actually specified Ezri's race yet. I ended up going with a Shadarkai, mostly down to the necrotic resistance and the you know, teleport helps if you're a fighter, I guess. And once again, think about the advice of beyond the books. It's all well and good saying that a Shadarkai is two links to a Raven Queen and the shadow fell. No, don't worry about that part. Just think about, does this help me mechanically in expressing the character I'm attempting to roleplay? It's very similar in outcome to how an optimizer might approach things, for example. What mechanics are going to help me perform better in the game? And whilst when we say perform better in the game, an optimizer is looking more at the mechanics and the actual gameplay encounters, social situations, etc. I'm more focused on seeing if I can get a character to be more interesting long term. And a huge part of this as well is going to be voicing your character. Now, I am by no means an expert. I've dabbled in voice acting here and there, but nothing in a massive professional capacity. So I don't feel like I can really advise you a huge amount on particular techniques in it. Just 
pick an accent and try it. I mean, I tried that horrendous Louisiana abomination at the beginning for Esri, and it stuck so far, even if it came across less as a Tom Kench impression and more Daniel Craig in Glass Onion. Thanks for, uh, thanks for pointing that out, DM. I hope this video has been somewhat helpful for you in some capacity for creating your own characters. And I just wanted to say thank you for the, the kind words and just general good reception I've had for the last video that I put up on the Archfey. I've also added a collection of some of the tracks that I use in the background here that were more Dark Fey adjacent earlier in the week. I'm generally going to try and aim for a little bit of a balance in music that I've created for use in my D&D campaigns and also for discussion points such as this. So have a very good day wherever you are and may your characters resonate with you as much as you wish.